so let's work on some problems from work and energy chapter number four for NET right so here we have a uh, question one and it says that a field in which the work done in a moving body is a closed path is zero is called we have electric field conservative field electromagnetic field and gravitational field right so well uh, we know that uh, when the work done on a body in a closed path is zero it is a conservative field so a conservative field is defined by this definition it's a field in which the work done in a moving body in a closed path is zero right these uh, gravitational field electric field these are examples of uh, a conservative field right but by definition a conservative field is a one in which the work done on a body in a closed path is zero right so if you remember in our lecture we did something like this we draw a path and we say that this is a closed path where points starting point a and ending point b are at the same position and it's a closed path right so if the work done in this path is zero then the field is conservative so the correct option for question number one is b so let's move on to question number two and it says which of the following types of force does no work on the particle when it acts on it right so we have frictional force but we know that a frictional force is a force for example this is your body and let's say the body is moving in this direction then we know that the friction force acts in this direction right so suppose that the body moves some distance d in this direction then the angle between your friction force and d is 180 degrees right and so if you were to compute f dot d which is f d cos theta this would give you a negative sign right cos of 180 and hence uh, this means that for friction force the work done is less than zero it's negative so it's not uh, zero right because the question says does no work then let's ha have a look at gravitational force uh, similarly we worked out in the lecture video we worked out uh, the expression for a gravitational uh, potential energy and we know that that is non-zero so this cannot be the answer as well we elastic force also we worked out the spring case and we know that the work then is uh, we have plus minus so this plus minus depends on the case and we have half k x squared right so that's the work done for the elastic force so it's either less or it's uh, greater than zero uh, then we have centripetal force now think about centripetal force what is centripetal force it's it's not really a, a force force but it's something that will keep uh, an object suppose there is an object moving it will keep this object moving in a circle right from this let's suppose that this is the object over here and this is the point center of the circle so the force is not basically uh, centripetal force is not based really moving this uh, object any distance right it's just keeping it in a circular orbit over here so that means uh, work done for a centripetal type of force would be zero right so the correct option is option d now let's move on to second uh, it's sorry the third problem and it says that the average power and instantaneous power become equal if work is done at we have a couple of options work is done at any rate work is done at a uniform rate or uh, work is done at a variable rate or at a very high rate so now think about this uh, the average power if you remember the expression for average power is given as the average work done 
divided by time and instantaneous power instantaneous power is given as limit delta t goes to zero delta work done change in work done divided by change in time so when are these two things going to be equal so again let's read the question the average power and instantaneous power become equal if work is done at so if this work was done at some uh, constant rate right so uniform rate then this would be uh, there would be no uh, really no change in the work done and so this expression would just come back to the work done per unit time and so this work done the value of this work done would be the average value of the work done right so that means that the work should be done at a constant rate or you can say a uniform rate so the correct option is option c wonderful so let's move on to a question four uh, we have that a proton electron neutron and alpha particles have same momentum so we're given that these uh, particles they have same momentum so this is a, a key point which of them have the highest kinetic energy so what do we know about this thing we know that uh, kinetic energy can be written in terms of momentum right we uh, derived an expression for this in the lecture video and that is simply k e is equal to p squared by 2n right so if the momentum is the same then we, we have to check the mass right so something that would have a higher mass would have less kinetic energy right so think about this uh, your your kinetic energy is inversely proportional to the mass right so if i increase my mass that means the kinetic energy should go down to keep this proportionality so that means any of these particles which have a lower mass would have the highest kinetic energy so now it's just a matter of determining which one has a lower mass so we have proton electron neutron and alpha particle so we know that an alpha particle it's made of two protons uh, or you can say that it's uh, the you say that the uh, this is the atomic uh, representation of uh, alpha particle right and then we have electron but electron is a subatomic uh, particle right so it's the it's the most fundamental particle so it would have the lowest possible mass because we know alpha particle is it is made up of protons and neutrons and electrons right but now we also know that a proton is made up of quarks right and we have uh, two up quarks and a down quark for a proton a neutron is made up of two down quarks and an up quark so these quarks are fundamental and the electron is fundamental so this means that uh, a quark would have a lowest mass and electron would have uh, a lowest mass so the uh, electron in all of these options is a particle with the lowest possible mass right because these protons they're made of three quarks and uh, similarly neutron is made up of three quarks so we are looking for something which has the lowest mass and uh, that would have the highest kinetic energy so that's electron and so the answer is b part wonderful so uh, let's move on and here we have question five and it reads that the work done by a variable force is determined by dividing force into small interval displacement into small intervals both force and displacement into small intervals 
force into small and displacement into large intervals. Now, remember when we discussed a variable force case, we drew a graph which looked something similar to what I'm about to draw. It looked something like, let's say this is a, a graph, right? And so we have force over here and displacement over here. And what we did was, see, this is a variable force, right? So at this point, there is some value of force. At this point, there is some more, some other value of force and so on, right? So what we, what did we do? Remember, we took this thing, we drew a line like this and we drew a line at, like this. So at start points and at end points, right? And then we divided these, uh, uh, the, the, you can say the area between these two lines or under this curve, we divided it with multiple lines, something uh, similar to this thing, right? So this is what we did. So what are we doing over here? What are we dividing into uh, small intervals? Remember that it was something like this and we have, uh, we had this thing as delta di, where i was the number of intervals, right? So what are we dividing over here in intervals? It is clear that we're dividing displacement into these small intervals, right? So the correct option is option B, right? Because we are not dividing force into any intervals. Look at this, there is no uh, force is not being divided into any intervals. This is purely a displacement being divided into intervals. And so th then all of the other options, they are just eliminated. Right, so uh, let's move on. Let's move to question number six. And it says that the gravitational potential energy of a body can be found by, so we are given a couple of expressions and then we are given uh, both B and C. So B is MGH, C is minus GM over R and A is GM over R. So remember that we know that a gravitational potential energy of a body, we can write it as uh, U is equal to minus G M over R, right? We write it like this. And the reason for this negative sign is because we assume that somewhere very far away from the source mass, uh, the gravitational potential energy is zero. And that far away point is, uh, we call it infinity, right? So that's why we ha uh, there has to be this negative sign because we're taking it away from uh, the source mass, right? So that's why the, uh, we have this negative sign. And so what is G, small g? So if you remember, G is minus g m over r squared, right? And we have, or uh, let me get rid of this. Uh, you know that uh, when you're on the surface of the earth, right? Whenever you're on the surface or on a ground surface and you have a body over here on this surface, so it's on a surface, and you raise this body to some height, let's say h, then the uh, gravitational potential energy for this body of mass m is defined as mgh, right? So, uh, of course, then uh, the potential energy can also be found by using mgh and it's found by using minus gm over r. So, the correct option is then this one which says both b and c, right? So, these two options. So, this is what I would choose. Right, let's go uh, to question number seven. And this is an interesting question because it's, uh, it's an odd one out. And it says that all the food that we eat in one day has about the same energy as one liter of petrol, one by third liter of petrol, uh, half liters of petrol, uh, or one by fourth liter of petrol. So think about it. Uh, what do you think that the correct answer should be, right? Uh, so uh, just take your time and think about it for some time. 
So I'll give you the answer to this question and uh, think about it and write your answers and your reasons for uh, why would you choose uh, that answer, right? So the correct answer to this is at least it's uh, one by three liters of petrol. So that's uh, option C, right? So next we have question eight, which says that the kinetic energy acquired by a body of mass M is traveling some distance S starting from rest under the actions of a constant force is directly proportional to. So you have to be very careful here because you might think that the kinetic energy is given by half M V squared. And so the power of M is just one, right? So you might uh, say that the answer to this is just part C, which is M, but that's not true. And the reason for that is, read the question again, we have uh, a body and it's starting from rest, right? And it starts from rest under constant force, and then it gains some velocity after some time. So if I draw it over here, then I have that here is this body, right? and it's of mass m. It starts initially uh, from rest, so let's call it uh, vi, and then it gains some velocity where it moves this distance s, right? And now its velocity is vf. So vi was zero, and there is some velocity vf. So what happened is, there has been an acceleration over here and that's the trick, right? So there has been some acceleration which increased the velocity from vi zero to some vf. So what is the expression that relates all these quantities? Let's look for that. Well, we know from Newton's uh, uh, equations we have vf squared minus vi squared is equal to 2as but vi squared is 0 so I know that vf squared would be 2as right so then uh, I know that the kinetic energy is half mv squared right and so what is A, right? What is A? I know that A, I can write it from F equals MA in terms of the force. And this just gives you A as F over M, right? So that's A. And now if I put it in this expression, I get V squared as 2F S over M. Now put this thing in this V squared, so I get kinetic energy is equal to half M into V squared is 2FS by M, 2FS by M. So M goes with M, 2 goes with 2, so kinetic energy is FS for a constant force, right? And so you can see that the M cancelled out. So there is no dependence of M in this expression for kinetic energy. Hence, the M power would be zero because there is no M, right? So the correct option would be option A. Right? Okay, great. So now let's move on to question number nine. And it reads that an engine pulls a car of mass 1500 kilograms on a level road at a constant speed of 5 meters per second. So we have an engine and it's pulling a car that has in total a mass of 1500 kilograms and it's pulling it on a road that is completely straight leveled and it's moving now because of this uh, engine is uh, pulling the car at speed of 5 meters per second. If the friction force is 500 newtons what power does the engine generate? So we want to see that uh, what would be the total power that the engine would produce considering that there is also a frictional force due to this motion which is given as 500 newtons. So we know that the expression for power 
is force times velocity, right? So it's the dot product of these two vectors. Now we are asked that uh, the power that does, what power does engine generate, right? So the force is, the frictional force is 500 newtons, right? So the engine should generate enough power so that it can overcome this frictional force to get the car moving. So then the force that I should have in this expression over here is the frictional force times the velocity, which is V, right? So, and the reason for this is again, because the engine should be able to overcome this frictional power to get the car moving in the first place. So that's, uh, we have 500 Newtons and we have speed as five meters per second. So that's two, five, zero, zero, right? So uh, we have one, two, yeah. So that's a uh, Newton meters per second, which I can write it down as 2.5 kilo Newton meters per second. But Newton meters per second is just watts. So we have 2.5 kilowatts. And so that's uh, this one, option B, right? So that's the correct option. Finally, let's move on to question number 10. And question number 10 says that the adjoining diagram shows the velocity, right? So the velocity versus time lot for a particle. The work done by the force on the particle is positive from what? So, okay, so let me just make this clear. First of all, we have A, we have B, we have C, D, and E, right? Okay, and this is velocity versus time. So we're given options B to C, D to E, A to B, or C to D. And we're asked that the work done by the force on the particle is positive from what part, right? So if you look at this graph, from A to B, the velocity is increasing. From B to C, the velocity is constant. C to D is where the velocity decreases. And again, D to E, the velocity becomes constant. So think about this. You have this uh, particle, let's just say this is a particle, and it's moving like this. So if it's moving like this, and I have a force in this same direction, if it's already moving and I apply a force in this direction, this force is going to do what? Well, the force will accelerate this object further in this direction of motion. So it would increase the velocity, right? It would increase the velocity in this direction. So from A to B, this is what is happening. From B to C, the velocity does not increase. So acceleration has become zero, which means the force from A to B, there is no force from A to B. But then C to D, what happens, the force is in this direction. And that's the reason your velocity decreases immediately and it goes uh, to so, uh, some lower velocity, right? Because it's now decelerating because the acceleration is in the other direction. And then from D to E, it again becomes a constant. So if I want uh, a positive work done, right? So we have to find the work done, which is positive. Then the work done is positive. If my force is acting in the favor of uh, the direction of motion, which is in this direction, right? Because the direction of motion is in this direction. So when that happens, that force will cause the velocity to increase. And the velocity is increasing from A to B. Hence, the correct option is option A. Uh, sorry, my bad, my bad. Uh, it's option C, right? Because this is one the one that says A to B. So that's the correct option. 
So with this, uh, I'll end the session of uh, practice problems of chapter number four for NET physics.